He has come down through history as America's first serial killer, the incarnation of pure evil. He was the first of a new breed of American celebrity, the handsome, debonair, and super intelligent mass murderer. His legend, fueled by his own insatiable appetite for exaggeration, would turn him into a monster, the arch fiend of the age, and the greatest criminal of this expiring century. His murder castle, situated at the heart of the world's greatest exhibition, was reputedly the scene of unspeakable horrors. Yet, the truth about Dr. H. H. Holmes is far removed from the sensationalism that surrounds his name. No one did more to turn the gossip into legend than Holmes himself, which makes it all the more difficult to get the truth about the devil in the White City. I was born with the devil in me. I could not help the fact that I was a murderer. More than a poet can help the inspiration to sing. The man who would come to call himself Henry Howard Holmes was born with a far less impressive name, and that was Herman Webster Mudgett on the 16th of May 1861 in Gilmanton, New Hampshire. By all accounts, his parents were upright and respectable people, with the child's upbringing being pretty unremarkable. Later stories that his father was a violent alcoholic who would smother his children with chloroform-soaked handkerchiefs to teach them a lesson are the result of a newspaper writer's overactive imagination. Yet there is one incident in Herman's youth, which clearly did have a profound impact on his later life. When he was about 13, two older boys dragged him into the local doctor's office, a place Herman was terrified of because of the various tales he'd been told about body parts lying around the place. The bullies brought the terrified boy face to face with a human skeleton, but rather than frightening him, the human bones, they fascinated the child. This fascination it grew into an adult desire to study medicine. Holmes had another early fascination, and that was with women. By the age of 16, he was working odd jobs when he fell head over heels in love with a beautiful young woman by the name of Clara Lovering. Herman met Clara while working on her father's farm. Soon after, they were both at a church social. Clara, though, well, she was flirting with another boy, and this made young Herman see red. He promptly marched over to the other boy and threatened to punch his lights out if he didn't get lost. Well, this seemed to impress young Clara, with Herman escorting her home arm in arm. The next day, he was telling everyone that they were engaged. The two, both 17 years of age at the time, were married by a justice of the peace on the 4th of July, 1878. For the first six months of the marriage, it was kept a secret, with the couple living apart with their parents. When it was finally revealed, Herman's mother wryly commented, she couldn't have done much worse and will probably have to support you. Clara's father arranged for Herman to work in his brother's grocery store in East Con Court. Nine months later, Clara, she gave birth to a son, who they named Robert. Becoming a father seems to have inspired Herman to pursue his interest in medicine. He quit the store and went home to take up an apprenticeship under Dr. Wright, the owner of the office in which he'd been introduced to the skeleton six years previously. Clara and the baby went to live with her parents. After a year, the budding medic took up more formal studies at the medical school in Burlington, Vermont. During this time, he conducted himself as a single man. In fact, he carried on a relationship with the daughter of his landlord that became so passionate that people thought they were engaged. When Herman's roommate, Fred Ingalls, revealed to the girl's father that he was already married, the two-timer laid a thrashing on Ingalls that left him with a black eye and scratched face. Darker than this, though, was the fact that the wife of the owner of the boarding house once noticed a foul smell emanating from Herman's room. On investigating, she was horrified to find a dead baby under his bed. His explanation was that he'd been experimenting with dissections as part of his homework. Herman was warned to never bring dead bodies into the house again. In 1882, Herman went to Ann Arbor to study at the University of Michigan. This time, he took his wife and son with him. But the marriage, well, it was already on shaky grounds. Other residents of the boarding house where they lived later recalled that the couple often quarreled, with Clara frequently sporting black eyes. At some point, Clara must have decided she had enough because she returned home with her baby. Their marriage, well, it was effectively over, but this would never be formalized. Now unfettered by family, Herman threw himself into his studies. He was particularly fascinated with the dissection of human bodies, loving nothing more than to cut his way into flesh and pull out body organs. Once more, he took to taking home infant corpses to work on during the spring break. His fellow students remembered that Herman's fascination with dissection, well, it was unnatural and unnerving. 
nothing. Then there's the question of whether or not Herman participated in a ruse of faking someone's death in order to collect insurance money. In his very dubious autobiography, he claims that he and his medical student pals spoke of the idea but never actually did it. And given his penchant for self-exaggeration, it seems unlikely he would have been shy about revealing this. The one scandal from his college days which can be substantiated involved, unsurprisingly, a woman. Though still married to Clara, he began courting the woman in whose boarding house he resided. He had promised to marry her, but then the woman found a letter in his room that was signed by his wife. This certainly shocked the woman, but she should have counted herself lucky, at least she didn't find a dead baby. Nevertheless, the woman complained to the medical school faculty, citing breach of promise. Herman appeared at a hearing and claimed the woman was lying and that he never promised to marry her. The faculty believed him, and he was acquitted. A few months later, on being handed his graduation diploma, though, Herman approached his professor and said, Doctor, those things that woman said about me are true. After graduating, Herman lived with his family back in New Hampshire during the summer of 1884. That autumn, he began working as both a physician and a schoolteacher in New York. During this time, he gains a reputation as a debt defaulter and a womanizer. He proposed marriage to two more women there, with the latter, Minnie Everett, backing out with a prophetic reflection. There is something lurking in that man's character that time will reveal. I do not like him firmly believed that he would commit murder. Herman also acquired a reputation as a swindler. He would use any number of excuses to get out of paying his rent. In the end, he left town in the middle of the night in order to escape a mountain of debt. He even swindled the price of his train ticket out of town. It was May of 1866, and that swindled train ticket had taken him to Chicago. It was his intention to find work in a drugstore, but he needed a pharmacy license in order to do that. He went to Springfield and sat a three-day examination. It was subsequently announced in the press that Harry H. Holmes had passed the bar. This announcement it marked the first time that the Holmes alias was used. Why he chose to call himself Harry Howard Holmes is still unknown. Contrary to what many people think, it's not a nod to Sherlock Holmes. Conan Doyle's most famous creation would not appear for yet another year. Holmes christened his new name by becoming a bigamist. On the way to Chicago, he spent time in Minneapolis, where he took up with and then married a young woman named Myrta Belknap. Myrta, she was rather plain looking, but her parents had money, and that was enough for Holmes. Shortly after moving to Chicago, he used this wealth to purchase a parcel of land on what was then 701 to 703 63rd Street in Englewood. He had ownership put into his wife's name and then into that of her mother in order to keep the creditors at bay. Holmes mythology tells us that the bad doctor needled his way into the employ of a bedridden pharmacist named E. S. Holton, whose young wife was run off her feet operating the business by herself. Holmes was hired to take over the operation, and shortly thereafter, the couple disappeared, with the implication here being that Holmes murdered them. But this isn't at all the reality of the situation. Instead, Dr. E. S. Holton was actually the wife. Her husband, rather than being on his deathbed, was a robust longshoreman. Dr. Holton took on Holmes and found him to be an ideal asset for the business. Business. When she became pregnant with her second child in 1887, she decided to sell the pharmacy to Holmes. Rather than disappearing, the Holtons both lived well into the 20th century, remaining in the same neighborhood that whole time. The pharmacy business became a great success, becoming especially popular with young women who came from afar to be served by the charming, handsome new doctor. Holmes he began taking on assistants who were invariably nubile young beauties who were flocking to Chicago by the trainful. At the same time, Holmes turned his attention to the vacant lot that he owned on the same street as the pharmacy. He planned to construct a two-story building with retail space on the first floor and residential apartments on the second. The building had some unusual features. There was a hidden compartment between the first and second floors, along with a staircase between floors that could only be reached from a trapdoor in the second-story bathroom. Far more troubling than these design quirks, however, was the fact that Holmes refused to pay his bills. When the builders, Admiral Iron and Steel, sued in 1888, Holmes claimed that he wasn't liable because the building was actually owned by his mother-in-law. When the building company lawyers began to chronicle his involvement in the project, Holmes alleged that one of the steel beams provided was too short, which negated the entire contract. Defending himself in court apparently did nothing to dwindle his passion for swindling. His favorite trick was buying goods on credit and then selling them for cash and not paying the original bill. In one case, he purchased an especially heavy safe on credit and had it installed on the first floor of his new building, having walls built around it. When the repossession agents came knocking, Holmes replied, go ahead and take the safe, but I warn you not to damage the building. 
The repossessors they struggled for hours, finally realizing that they couldn't get it out without tearing down a wall. They had no choice but to leave the safe exactly where it was. The people who worked for Holmes soon got used to his quirky ways. He once invited a worker to step inside the safe and start yelling when Holmes closed the door in order to test if it was soundproof. His housekeeper would also regularly catch him tiptoeing around at night, and the janitor, who worked at the pharmacy, recalled a time when Holmes showed him a collection of fake beards and other disguises. In 1890, Holmes decided to sell the drugstore business in order to focus on real estate. Unsurprisingly, the sale had turned into another swindle. After the new owner took possession, he was shocked to find that much of the floor stock had not been paid for, with repossession agents claiming them back. Still, Holmes somehow managed to talk his way out of this trouble. In fact, even though he no longer owns the drugstore, he still spent a lot of time there. He just so happened to be on hands one day when one of the new investors showed up with important information to share. The man then inexplicably collapsed right outside the drugstore. Holmes was the first one to his side, pouring a dark liquid down the man's throat. Within minutes, he was dead. This was likely the first person to die at the hands of Dr. Holmes, killed likely because he knew too much about the mad medic, although we'll never really know what that information he had was. In July of 1889, Holmes employed a young couple, Ned and Julia Connor, who worked in the pharmacy and lived on the second floor of the recently completed Englewood building. Within a month, Holmes and Julia were engaged in a torrid affair, even as Myrtle lived under the same roof. This understandably drove a wedge between the couple, with Ned filing for divorce and quitting Holmes as employ. Julia now started to entangle herself in Holmes's financial web. He listed her as the co-founder of a number of businesses and took out numerous debts in her name. Then, on July 4, 1891, Julia and her 80-year-old daughter Pearl disappeared off the face of the earth. The bodies were never discovered, and Holmes never confessed to murdering them, but it seems quite likely that they were the next victims of the deadly doctor. Around this same time, Holmes started a brand new business, and this was the Warner Glass Bending Company. Despite the fact that he knew nothing about glass bending, he convinced those who would listen that he had invented a unique glass bending technique. To perfect it, he had built a furnace in the basement of his two-story building and made a great show of setting to work, though no one actually saw him bend any glass. After the establishment of his basement furnace, the disappearance of young women who came into Holmes' circle became more and more frequent. First, there was Emmeline Sagrand, who came to Chicago looking for work in May of 1892. Holmes employed her as a typewriter girl and was soon getting much more for his money. When the girl disappeared around Christmas time, Holmes dismissed it with what became a common explanation. She's gone to Europe to get married. By the end of 1892, the whole city of Chicago was abuzz with the prospect of the approaching World's Fair in celebration of the 400th anniversary of Columbus's landing on the Americas. Never one to pass up an opportunity, Holmes quickly had a third story put onto his building to serve as a hotel. However, he never really intended to use the floor as a hotel. The amount Holmes could make renting out rooms was small potatoes compared with what he could make by convincing others that he was opening a hotel. With such a venture in the works, he could raise money from investors who'd never see a penny back. He could also buy numerous goods on credit and sell them without paying for them, and then as a final windfall, he decided to make thousands in insurance money by setting the building on fire. Despite the popular notion that the Holmes Hotel was flourishing during the World's Fair, luring countless women to their death, there are no records that he even took in a single paying customer. When he set the structure ablaze on August 13, 1893 to claim the insurance, the only people on the site were long-term residents. The resulting claim would spend years going through the courts, by which time the claimants would be behind bars. With mounting lawsuits, Holmes decided that it was time to quit Chicago. His travels took him to Denver, Fort Worth, Texas, St. Louis, and finally to Philadelphia. Along the way, he got married once more, this time to a 23-year-old with a $2,000 inheritance. He also fell in with a like-minded swindler by the name of Benjamin Piazzol. Piazzol later got himself thrown in jail for passing bad checks, and while he was inside, Holmes began paying the premiums on his life insurance policy. When he got out, the two joined forces and purchased a vacant lot in Fort Worth. He 
Here they set about building a replica of the complex that Holmes had built and then burnt to the ground in Chicago. Just like the original building, the Texas Hotel featured a number of strange passages and twists, but just what Holmes planned to do with the building is unclear. He never hung around long enough to use it. What he and Piazzol did do was take out tens of thousands of dollars on mortgages in it and then disappear without making more than a couple of token payments. The two moved to St. Louis, where Holmes bought a drugstore for the down payment of $50 and promissory notes that were completely worthless. What a surprise. Piazzol then approached a drugstore supplier and convinced him that he was interested in buying the drugstore from Holmes. If they lent him the money, he would then use them as their main supplier. They agreed. The swindle, though, it came unstuck when the drugstore's rep called in the next day, only to find the place shuttered up. He got suspicious and called in the authorities. Holmes was arrested, and he spent three days in jail. On his release, Holmes headed for Philadelphia and the swindle that would prove his undoing. Here, he planned to make good on those insurance premiums he'd paid for Piazzol a few months back. The two men had long been scheming to defraud the Fidelity Mutual Insurance Company by faking Piazzol's death and splitting the proceeds. In early September, however, Piazzol got cold feet and wanted to back out. An unhappy Holmes agreed to meet up the next day to further discuss the issue. When he turned up at Piazzol's address, Holmes proceeded to get him drunk. Then he knocked him out with a chloroform handkerchief, increasing his dosage until his old friend was dead. Holmes then attempted to stage the scene to make it look like an accident. Then, with his 23-year-old wife in tow, he jumped on a train for Indianapolis, intent on securing the $10,000 insurance payout. In the end, the payout was made to Piazzol's widow, but Holmes convinced her that her husband had died, owing him $7,500 for the Texas building. She handed the money over. As an act of seeming graciousness, Holmes agreed to accompany the Piazzol children to Indianapolis, where they were to stay with their aunt. Before he could deliver them, however, he discovered that he was a wanted man. Authorities from a number of states, including Philadelphia, were keen to talk to him. Now officially on the run, he moved the children all over the countryside. At some point, though, he decided that the children would have to die. The youngest, 8-year-old Howard, was poisoned with cyanide, while the two girls were likely gassed to death. The bodies were buried in a cellar. By now, detectives were hot on Holmes' trail. They finally caught up with him in Boston and, of all things, arrested him for horse theft. A raft of further charges followed, and in October of 1895, he was convicted of murdering Benjamin Piazzol. Holmes subsequently confessed to 27 murders and was hanged on May 7, 1896. His dying wish was for his body to be buried under 10 feet of concrete to prevent grave robbers from stealing and dissecting his body, a luxury which he denied many of his victims. So I won't ask whether you enjoyed that video, but I sure hope you found it interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. We do two videos just like this, focusing on some important person from history or present day every day of the week. So two videos a week, hit subscribe, you'll get those. Do check out some of our other videos that are linked to on the screen now, as well as in the description below. And as always, Thank you for watching.